One of the hardest decisions I find myself faced with when playing a game is this one. It's almost always the first choice you make, and it is one of the biggest deciding factors on what kind of experience you're going to have. For the longest time, it's something I never paid much mind to, always just selecting normal or whatever seemed to be its equivalent, because I figured that must be the intended experience. Like, it's literally called normal, so you'd assume the game must be best balanced around that mode. But more recently, I've realized that's not always the case. One example of this that I've touched on a bit in the past can be seen with The Witcher 3. Its normal option, Story and Swords, provides a decent challenge and certainly will be a good option for some, but I found it to be underwhelming as I was able to pretty easily beat the game without engaging with most of its systems. Aside from a few tutorial quests that forced me to use alchemy in the bestiary, I pretty much ignored them entirely, because in the time it would take me to read up on a monster's weakness and create an oil or decoction to help me take it out, I could have already killed it and been on to the next one. Using those mechanics didn't feel worth my time, which is a bummer because they're interesting systems systems that encourage exploring and engaging with the world and lore in meaningful ways. They are an important piece of what makes The Witcher 3's gameplay loop feel so good, but as I didn't use them, I missed out on most of that, and once I finished my first playthrough, I walked away feeling bored and unimpressed. Then last year, after a handful of failed attempts of getting back into it on a higher difficulty, I finally fully dedicated myself to a Death March playthrough, and it felt like an entirely different game. All of the mechanics I once ignored became integral to my success, as certain fights were simply impossible without them. It encouraged a playstyle that pushed me to learn about the world and think carefully about every encounter, making me feel like a witcher instead of a typical video game hero. And this made it so much more distinct from most other open world games I've played. Now, I don't think Death March fixes every issue with the game or its combat, but at the very least, it got me to approach it in a much more enjoyable way than I did the first time. The thing is, if I hadn't read up on it and been told by friends to give Death March an honest shot, I never would have known to try it. And even if I had decided to start with it unprompted, I would have changed difficulties almost immediately, because the first encounter absolutely wrecked me. Like, I died over five times to these stupid ghouls. On Death March, they have the capability to take you out in just a few hits, and as you don't have any notable gear or items, there are no advantages to lean on. Also, given my pretty simple experience on Story and Swords, I wasn't used to needing to dodge so frequently or wait for openings to attack, so it took me a good while to get those things down. Had this been my first playthrough, I would have made the very fair assumption that I was in over my head, as dying so many times during what is for all intents and purposes still part of the tutorial is a pretty clear sign that you should turn the difficulty down. But in reality, Death March isn't nearly as punishing as this first encounter makes it out to be. To be honest, I struggled more with this fight than any other I came across throughout my 100 plus hour playthrough, and the only thing that killed me more than these ghouls was gravity. My whole experience with the Witcher 3 illustrates one of the bigger issues that comes from having difficulty options. If players don't pick the right one, it can turn a game they would have otherwise really loved into one that never manages to impress them. And it all starts with having to make a guess of which setting will be right for them. If it were just about players having to assess their skill level in any given genre, that'd be hard enough. But they also have to contend with the fact that every title is balanced differently, and a hard mode in one game is not the same as a hard mode in another. Honestly, when it comes to The Witcher 3, I still don't know if the reason I like Death March so much is because I'm an above average player or because CD Projekt Red did a bad job of picking out what their default mode should be. When playing something new, the only thing I can really base my decision off of is what difficulty level I went with for other games. And even though it might get me close a lot of the time, it obviously is a flawed way to do it because it is using irrelevant information. It takes actually playing something to have any real idea, but as I already pointed out with the ghouls, even that can be misleading. An early lull or spike in difficulty can give an inaccurate depiction of what a setting will be like to play long term. The logical solution to this problem is to just switch difficulties throughout a playthrough. When things start to feel mindless, bump it up, and when it seems like you're constantly bashing your head against the wall, turn it down. But I find that this is easier said than done. For instance, I like the feeling I get from overcoming challenging games. So when I run into an obstacle that seems out of my league, a part of me always wants to figure out how to get past it. Even though I don't think I should feel this way, lowering the difficulty seems like a sort of failure. It's me giving up on the chance to enjoy the sweet satisfaction of getting good. There are times where it's obvious that I should just switch, so I do, but more often than not, I feel inclined to just keep pushing through it, to keep trying regardless of how frustrating it gets. Putting this much effort into conquering a challenge certainly can pay off. 
but with some titles, it really only serves to hurt its general vibe and pacing. Like playing The Last of Us on the highest difficulty has its merits, but for many, it will lead to getting torn apart by clickers so many times that they'll forget what Joel and Ellie are even trying to do. Getting through these encounters will probably feel satisfying to a degree, but it will come at the cost of the game's story, which I'd argue is a much more important aspect, especially during a first playthrough. As for turning the difficulty up, I'm often resistant to do this as well because I never know what's coming up ahead. If I bump it up but then the next area is far more challenging, I may have to turn it back down again, which would feel kind of bad. Furthermore, I worry that jumping between difficulties might undermine certain moments. If a section feels especially easy or hard, there very well could be an intended and important reason for that. A pretty famous example of this sort of thing can be seen with God of War 2018 when Kratos is preparing to go to Helheim. In order to weather the conditions of the Realm of the Dead, he has to retrieve the Blades of Chaos, weapons from his past that he hoped to keep buried. On the way to get them, he's confronted by a group of Hellwalkers, all of whom are resistant to the icy nature of the Leviathan Axe, essentially forcing the player to use Kratos' fists and shield to take them out. This leads to a pretty grueling and demanding fight, where the weapon you've come to rely on is useless. Then after getting the Blades of Chaos, Kratos is attacked by another group of Hellwalkers, and all the tension and frustration that was built up from the previous fight is immediately unleashed, as Kratos slices through them with ease, demonstrating a clear increase to his power that thematically aligns with the narrative. But if you were to lower the difficulty to get through the first fight more easily and raise it during the second so it would be more of a challenge, this sequence wouldn't be nearly as effective. Admittedly, it is unlikely that someone will change the difficulty during this section as it isn't long enough to cause so much frustration that they'd feel the need to switch, but just knowing that games do this sort of thing always makes me wonder if I'm in the middle of a sequence that will soon have a big payoff or playing on the wrong difficulty. Even if I didn't let these mind games get in my way, changing from one difficulty to the next doesn't even guarantee that it will balance things perfectly, as there are so many different aspects of a game that can affect how easy or hard it is, and in a lot of cases, changing the difficulty will shift all of them. So if you're playing an action-adventure title on medium and feel like the puzzles are the exact right amount of challenge, but the combat seems trivial, changing it to hard may address your issues with fights, but it might come at the cost of puzzles becoming frustrating. The best way to solve this problem is by making the difficulty settings of a game highly customizable. When players are able to adjust specific aspects like how aggressive enemies are, or how much time they have to solve a puzzle, or the amount of experience they get from winning a fight, it makes it possible for any given player to balance the game in a way that is just right for them. At least, that's how it works in theory, but I found that in practice, it's much more complicated than that. I do appreciate the idea of being given full control over my experience, but more often than not, having these options quickly becomes overwhelming, because when playing a game for the first time, I have no idea what settings will lead to the optimal experience, and frankly, I probably wouldn't fully know on a second playthrough either. More options may give players the capability to perfectly balance the difficulty of a game, but that doesn't mean they have the know-how to actually do it. Now, if there are just a few options to pick from, it probably won't be that tough to figure out what to adjust, but the fewer options there are, the more likely it'll be to run into the same issues as games that don't have any customization. When there are a wide range of options though, it can take a ton of trial and error to figure out what works best, to see how different settings interact with each other to augment the difficulty. And I think for most players, putting a bunch of effort into troubleshooting a game's difficulty in the hopes of finding the right balance isn't how they want to spend their time. They're not the game designer. They don't have a good grasp of how any small change may impact their long-term enjoyment. Also, constantly modifying various aspects of a title to see what works best can create a disjointed experience, and that might make it harder to get into or appreciate a title. At the end of the day, most people just want to play video games without having to think about it. To clarify, I'm not trying to advocate that games should never include this kind of customization. Honestly, I really do like the idea of it, and I imagine there are plenty of players out there who get a lot of value from being able to make these small, specific adjustments. However, I've learned that I don't enjoy the process of figuring it out, which typically leads to me ignoring them, but still always wondering if I can make things better. In general, it's kind of nice when I am not solely in charge of the decision, when the game gives some sort of feedback of what is right for me. One approach like this is when a game puts the player through some type of measurable test in order to judge their skill. The first time I ever experienced something like this was in Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare.
fair. The intro puts the player through a typical tutorial assault course, and the recommended difficulty is determined by how quickly they clear it. This seems like a great approach, as instead of making the player judge how good they are, the game itself takes a sample of their gameplay and tells them how prepared they will be for the challenges in store. Of course, while this is an intriguing approach, it doesn't mean that it comes with no issues or uncertainties. For instance, judging someone on how good they are at a game when they're first getting the hang of it isn't the best sample of their actual skill. If a player runs through the course once while still figuring out the basics and doesn't give it another try, there's a chance they'll be recommended too low of a difficulty. On the other hand, if a player does what I did the first time I played COD 4 and stubbornly grind the course over and over again until they practically memorized it and can do it fast enough to be recommended veteran, then they will almost certainly be setting themselves up for failure, as doing that doesn't actually make them good at the game. It just makes them good at that very specific challenge. The tutorial does test the player's reaction time and how well they can position themselves, but it doesn't account for other important aspects like their decision making or ability to avoid taking damage. It is just one small piece of what makes a player good at the game. And this sort of approach becomes even more questionable when looking at titles that don't rely on precision or quick reflexes in the way that shooters do. Take The Witcher 2 Enhanced Edition, which came out a little under a year after the base game and added a tutorial that has Geralt fighting in an arena against various enemies and monsters. At the end of it, the player is put up against a handful of foes that get increasingly more powerful, and the more enemies they are able to kill, the higher the recommended difficulty will be. However, the arena is not really representative of how players will normally approach combat, as it mostly ignores the whole preparation aspect of the game. Also, the tutorial has no way of assessing the way in which which the player kills or dies to the various enemies, which can lead to a bad recommendation. Generally, a player with a fair bit of skill is more likely to take risks, and even though they may have a grasp over the combat, as they are playing more aggressively, there is a higher chance of them making a small mistake that costs them their life, whereas someone with less skill who plays as cautiously as possible could theoretically take out each of the enemies if they have enough patience. And due to how The Witcher 2 recommends difficulty, both players would be given settings that don't make sense for them. This can have a ton of consequences, one of the most notable being that it might condition the less skilled player to approach every encounter as conservatively as possible, which isn't how the game was really designed to be played. Of course, all these titles do still give players the option to pick whatever difficulty they want, but it's hard to go against what a game recommends, as you'd assume it has a better idea about things than you do. Even though this approach is cool, it clearly is not the most effective way to determine player skill, and I think the fact that more games don't use it is proof of that. The reality is, with most titles, there just isn't a good way to measure a player's skill quickly. Frankly, one of the most important things a player can have is game knowledge, which is a hard thing to test for, especially in a tutorial. And that's why assessing a player's skill for a longer amount of time and further into a game leads to better results. The way this is typically done is by dynamically shifting the difficulty based on how well or poorly the player is doing. Most games have this to a degree, although we don't always think of it as a difficulty modifier. For example, a lot of titles will drop more health or ammo when you're low on one or the other. While it's easy to just see this as common sense and not something tied to difficulty, if a player is constantly out of ammo, there's a good chance it's partially because they are inaccurate with their shots. And if they're always low on health, it most likely means they're taking hits they don't need to. So being given these things as a result essentially makes things easier for them. It's a small adjustment that doesn't shift the core gameplay, but it does balance things out for those who aren't as skilled. There are, of course, far more impactful implementations of dynamic difficulty. Take the Resident Evil series. Depending on how accurate your shooting is and how often you take damage or get killed, enemy behavior and even the amount of them will change, making things more manageable for those who struggle by having enemies be less aggressive and giving a nice bit of extra challenge for those that have things down by making the baddies more hostile. On paper, adaptive difficulty is perfect as it takes the decision out of the player's hand by making adjustments based on their actual performance over a long portion of time. Most Resident Evil titles do still have difficulty options options, but players don't need to be as exact with their guesses of what's right for them because the game will adjust to a more comfortable spot. An approach like this helps preserve game feel and flow, keeping the pace of a game as smooth and as enjoyable as possible. And when looking at a title like Resident Evil 4, which is maybe the best paced game ever made, it's a hard idea to argue with. 
Also, as it is done subtly and isn't something Capcom seemingly ever talks about, most players won't even notice it. So clearing sections even after they've been made easier feels just as satisfying, because the player will assume they finally got good enough to overcome it. The thing is, and maybe this makes me a stubborn old man, most of the time I don't want to feel as if I've gotten good enough to overcome something, I want to get good enough to overcome something. And it's not even about the principle of the matter, it's just that I like figuring things out, and if I know the game is figuring some of it out for me, I feel a bit cheated. I care about this sort of thing more with some titles than others, but in general, I'd rather avoid it. Now, I personally don't mind when a game gets harder if I'm playing well, as like I said, I enjoy getting past things by the skin of my teeth, but a part of me doesn't love the idea of getting bumped up to a harder difficulty and then having that new challenge be taken away if I'm not immediately successful at it. It's also worth noting that the increased challenge could push players to approach encounters in a more cautious way that they find less enjoyable. This may make them more successful, but that's not necessarily the same thing as having more fun. All things considered, for a lot of people, especially those who don't really care about these things, adaptive difficulty is one of the better approaches. But for me personally, with most games, I'd always rather play with it off, as I want all the credit to go to me. But I don't think the majority of titles that incorporate some form of it would really want to have a visible toggle, as drawing attention to it takes away a lot of the magic. For all these reasons, as irrational as it may sound, a part of me prefers when a game has no difficulty options. I like not having to worry whether or not I'm playing with the right settings, or if the game is making things easier for me without me knowing. The experience is what it is, and there's something to that simplicity that's kind of nice. I think in some cases, it also pushes people to embrace a game's difficulty in a way they might not have had there been options. And yeah, I'm sure you knew I'd get here sooner or later, but this is the part of the video where I start talking about Dark Souls. The Souls series, and really every modern FromSoft title, has become the centerpiece of difficulty discourse, and that's because the relentless nature of these games is one of the major reasons many have become so attached to them. There is something about their cruel and bleak worlds that is strangely compelling, and the gameplay feeds into that feeling so well. They present so many challenges that take a ton of effort to overcome, so getting to the point where you are able to overcome them feels incredible. With most titles, the gap between having and and not having a great grasp of the core gameplay is going to be noticeable, but more often than not, people in either camp will still be able to progress. But with Dark Souls, that is not the case. That gap makes all the difference in the world, and while there are multiple approaches of how to close it, at one point or another, the player has to figure out how to do it. And when they do, that feeling is unforgettable. Before playing Demon's Souls for the first time, I didn't think hard games were my thing, but it proved to me that they could be, and playing Dark Souls made it clear that I didn't just like them, but that they had the potential to be the most meaningful gaming experiences I've ever had. With Demon's Souls in particular, had it been designed with multiple difficulty options, I don't know for sure whether or not I would have switched to a lower one, but I definitely would have been constantly questioning if I had picked the right choice. Instead though, all I could really do was focus on finding a way through the game. I had to embrace its uncomfortable challenge or else be out 60 bucks. And that experience of going from thinking it'd be impossible to scraping and clawing my way to the credits meant a lot to me. And I know this is not a unique occurrence. Almost everyone I've talked to about these titles who's fallen in love with them has gone through something similar, and a lot of the time, what they got out of it transcended the game itself. From helping people cope with depression and anxiety, to teaching them that even when something seems impossible, it can still be overcome, these games have grown to mean so much more to people than just a way to spend their spare time. While it isn't the only factor, the unyielding nature of these titles is a big reason why people love them so much, and having a single set difficulty is part of what makes that possible. Of course, the consequence of being designed in this way is that it creates a skill window the player must fit within in order to stand a reasonable chance of enjoying the gameplay. As nice as it is to not spend time thinking about whether you chose the right setting or not, the trade-off is there's a chance you'll be questioning whether you are the right player for the game or not. When a title has a set difficulty that's on the more punishing side of things, by design it will be less approachable than a game that has options, and some players just won't have the skill it takes to get through it. And that idea is daunting and can make it hard to want to engage with them in the first place. With that said, when it comes to a lot of 
titles that fall into this camp like Dark Souls and pretty much everything else FromSoft has put out in the past 15 years, the skill needed in order to play and enjoy them isn't nearly as high as their reputation makes it out to be. Many people do choose to play them in a way that requires high skill and proficiency, but aside from arguably Sekiro, FromSoft has always designed their games in a way that gives many different options to players so they aren't stuck with an approach that's not well suited for their skill set. It's just that these are chosen through the gameplay instead of an options menu. Looking at Dark Souls specifically, you don't need to just tackle it with a sword. There are solid ranged options as well as a ton of powerful spells, both of which allow players to keep distance from enemies while still being able to do damage. Most likely, neither will fully replace the need to engage in melee combat, but using them will make it less frequent, letting the player stay out of harm's way more often. Using these mechanics doesn't make the game unchallenging, but as they don't require the same level of precision that fighting an enemy with just a sword does, they do make it possible for players that don't have a quick reaction skill set to find success. The most useful mechanic to help players overcome tough challenges though is the summoning system, which allows them to fight alongside NPCs or even other players. Having a summon does increase the health of bosses, but the vast majority of the time, that shift doesn't come close to outweighing the benefit that comes from having a partner. Playing with a summon fundamentally changes the dynamics of every encounter. It becomes less about fully learning a boss's moveset and more about capitalizing on the moments that their focus is on the other person. This doesn't lead to fights being mindless, but it does make it easier to find an opening to attack. NPC summons are available for many of the bosses, and player summons can be placed at pretty much any of them, so with enough luck, there will be an option to bring in some help. In general, I find this approach to be pretty cool, as it pushes players to discover what mechanics are best suited for them. Getting stuck is an opportunity for the player to assess all of the options at their disposal and utilize whatever ones will help them move forward. Or at least that's how it's supposed to work, but in reality, it isn't nearly that clean. Dark Souls doesn't do a whole lot to explain anything really, so for a first time player it can be unclear how to engage with systems like magic and especially summoning. Neither is super complicated, and the game does do a handful of things to try to get players to stumble across how both work, but this approach makes them easy to overlook or even miss, causing new players to be far more likely to default to simpler options like melee. For many, the way they'll learn how these things work is by looking them up, which I don't think is entirely a bad thing as the sharing of knowledge helps build community and that has no doubt played a big role in Dark Souls Souls growing such a strong one, but also it can be frustrating when mechanics that would benefit a player immensely either take a bit of luck or an external source to figure out. Also, as far as summoning goes, it relies on having humanity, which is a relatively scarce resource, so if a player runs out, they no longer can get assistance until they find more. Mix this with being susceptible to getting invaded when in human form, and it creates a bunch of hoops struggling players need to jump through to get the help they need. And some of those hoops just aren't very fun. Like in order to be able to use some consistently, struggling players will probably need to farm humanity, which sucks because killing these stupid rats over and over again is not compelling gameplay, but a decent amount of people will feel incentivized to do it anyway. And this is a major problem that comes from using difficulty as a way to incentivize engaging with a title's various mechanics. It can instead lead to unfortunate player behavior. When I think back to my first experience with Demon Souls, as much as I find myself romanticizing it now, I didn't really find the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay to be all that fun. I never got good at fighting, and I died so many times that I barely even had the option to use summons. So to get through the game, I did stuff like this, and this, and this. I would grind the same group of enemies for far too long so that I could get souls to level up and buy as many arrows as I could afford in order to cheese bosses. This isn't an invalid way to play Demon Souls, Dark Souls, or any of the others, but as someone who has now beaten pretty much everything FromSoft has recently put out, I do think it is the least enjoyable approach. However, for some players, it will feel like the only approach, and depending on their skill, it might be. While I do like the Dark Souls design philosophy of presenting all players with the same challenge and giving them a wealth of gameplay options so they can find what works best for them, it does have the potential to create a disconnect between how a player wants to play and how they need to play. Like, it's great that summons are an option, but as I said before, they do fundamentally change how boss fights work, and it leads to a much different experience than fighting them solo. There is nothing wrong with either approach, however, if a player prefers what combat feels like without having a summon, but gets completely stuck on every boss they try to take on alone, they'll kind of be forced into using one if they want to progress. 
boss. And as using summons is so different, doing this won't really help them get better at fighting bosses alone, so it doesn't even act as a way to build up to a new challenge. On the other end of things, more skilled players who enjoy summons, whether it be for lore or gameplay reasons, may feel like they can't really use them without things getting too easy. Obviously, they can just do a second playthrough with summons that's less focused on the challenge, but I don't think it's ideal that they'll feel the need to ignore the mechanic on their first in order to maintain a certain level of difficulty. In FromSoft's pursuit of having everyone face the same challenge, players are pushed towards or away from certain mechanics largely because of their skill and not their preferred playstyle. Depending on what group they fall into, they'll have completely different experiences that don't really resemble each other in any notable way. I don't think this is inherently a bad thing. For many players, this approach will get them to engage with the game in the way that's best suited for them. But for others, it will make them feel like they're only left with bad options. Some players just won't have the skill to beat bosses alone without putting in far more time than the vast majority of people. So it makes a lot of sense to me why someone in that position would want there to be multiple difficulties. If they could drop down to a lower setting that among other things had them deal more damage and take less of it, they'd be able to overcome bosses in a time frame that more closely resembles what it takes for the average player while still experiencing the core gameplay of solo combat. And technically, this is something people can do in Dark Souls. It just requires grinding, a solution that comes at the cost of the core gameplay loop turning into a tedious waste of time. I know some people will say that these kinds of games just aren't for these kinds of players, but I don't think it's that simple. Not being good at something doesn't mean you can't love it. Feeling skilled out of a game you adore has to be frustrating, especially because there is so much more to these titles than them just being hard. And honestly, this is something FromSoft seems to be very conscious of based on how the design of their games has shifted over the years. This is best seen with Elden Ring, which pretty effectively addresses some of the pain points that are common for less experienced players. And in typical FromSoft fashion, they even managed to do it without including traditional difficulty settings. Progress on the main quest is gated by a series of extremely difficult bosses, the first and arguably harshest being Margit. Trying to take any of them on without being properly prepared will most likely lead to failure, so players are incentivized to explore the lands between to collect runes, weapons, and all sorts of other resources in order to get strong enough to take on the immense challenge of the mandatory bosses. The difficulty pushes them to engage with the open world, which is great as it's Elden Ring's most interesting aspect. There are so many things to do, and many of them are manageable challenges even for less skilled players. While some endeavors will be more rewarding for certain builds than others, players will almost always walk away with their character being stronger than they were before. The answer to getting stuck is to check out somewhere else, and this is a much more satisfying solution than grinding the same group of enemies over and over again. For those who struggle with these games but don't enjoy using summons, this gives them a way to still play on their own without spending time doing repetitive activities. As for summons, Elden Ring adjusted how they work to make them far more reliable. NPC summons don't require the use of an item, so using them is always an option. Player summons are still tied to one, but it's so easy to get that it's rarely a barrier. And of course, Spirit Ashes can be used pretty much on every boss, and they offer a wide range of companions to choose from that can help with various challenges. They also can be upgraded, making them a very powerful part of the player's arsenal. All of this not only expands the skill window significantly, but it also also gives players more viable and interesting ways to handle the challenge. Now, as much as I wish I could say that this is the perfect approach, unfortunately, it does create some issues. Uncovering the secrets of the lands between was my favorite part of the game, so I wanted to do a ton of it. But as exploring had a direct correlation to my character's strength, that resulted in me getting overleveled quickly. Enemies and bosses don't scale as you level up, which can make a lot of them become trivial. For the middle chunk of the game, I found everything I came across to be pretty easy. I was able to muscle through boss fights on my first try without having to learn how they work or even really be cautious. This put me in a spot where I felt like I had to choose between exploring and having things feel challenging, which was a bummer, as those are my two favorite things about the game. One of my friends ran into a similar issue and actually decided to stop upgrading his main weapon so that things wouldn't get too easy. I thought about doing the same, but I ended up not, as I like the feeling of my character progressing. Seeing number go up is part of what motivates me, and choosing to opt out of certain upgrades would cause exploring to be a little pointless. While I wish I could explore stuff for the sake of exploring, I am very extrinsically motivated, so it just didn't seem like a good option. Also, trying to balance the difficulty by only upgrading things to a certain point starts to feel a lot like games with tons of difficulty options that can be adjusted, and just like with that, how am I supposed to know what the right balance will be? I know some people will say, do whatever is the most fun, but I have no idea how to figure that out without spending a bunch of time testing stuff, and that's not what I wanted to do. 
Elden Ring is a much smoother experience than FromSoft's previous titles, but it still runs into the same issue that pretty much every game with a single set difficulty does, of players needing to moderate what systems they engage with if they want to have things be a proper challenge. And that's especially a bummer when one of those systems is the best part of the game. So what? Would adding difficulty options be a way to fix these issues? And I mean, yeah, they would fix a lot of them, but then there would be new ones that would be solved by not having difficulty options. The reality is it's all kind of bad. There are problems with every approach, and it is unlikely that a game will ever feel perfectly balanced. Of course, in a lot of instances, it will be close enough. I do want to make it clear that the challenge of finding the perfect way to balance difficulty in video games is not an epidemic or anything that severe, but it is a problem that lacks an ideal solution. And frankly, there is so much more to it than what I've covered here. This whole video looks at balance from the perspective of players wanting a challenge that feels suited for their skill level, but in reality, that's not what everyone wants. Some people love the power fantasy of decimating everything they come in contact with, and others like feeling powerless in whether or not what they do will help them succeed. Or at least I assume they do, otherwise I don't know why anyone would still be playing League. And on that note, there's a ton to be said about how to balance the difficulty of multiplayer games, because for someone to win, a different person has to lose. This is made more complicated by the fact that an evenly balanced lobby is not necessarily a fun lobby, as it can lead to a playstyle that is overly sweaty and disincentivizes doing anything outside the meta, but the alternative means a certain chunk of players will just always lose, so who should be prioritized? Additionally, it's important to consider how accessibility fits in, as even though it's different from difficulty and the two should not be conflated, there is overlap between them. The goal of accessibility options is to address specific issues and barriers that exist for different disabled players, and in some cases that involves including settings that impact difficulty. So developers also have to consider how best to implement these features so that they are actually effective tools for those who need them. Ultimately, there are so many things to consider when balancing a game, and there will always be some down side to whatever choice is made. There are just too many of us and we're too different for there to even be a chance. With that said, I think one of the best things developers can do is to make it clear to players what the intended experience is supposed to feel like. When they communicate their intentions, explain how different settings will impact the core experience, and at the very least give more specific descriptions than it's going to be hard, it goes a long way with helping players figure out what will make sense for them. This is easier said than done for certain titles, as some games have pretty flexible intended experiences, but even then, the more the player knows, the easier it will be for them to choose what to go with. Personally, my favorite approach is when a game presents itself as having a single set difficulty, but whether it be through an assist mode or the accessibility options, also offers ways to shift things for those who need it. This approach makes it clear what the experience is supposed to be and challenges players of all skill levels to engage with it, but it gives people the ability to choose how they want to play if something is just a bit off for them. When presented in this way, players will be less likely to use it on a whim and largely only turn to it when the alternative is quitting altogether. Of course, this approach has problems too. Like I said, they all do. It's impossible for things to not be a bit messy. Life is unbalanced, and so there will always be flaws with the difficulty of a game, and unfortunately that will get in the way of us being able to enjoy them at times. All we can really do is gravitate towards the approaches that bother us the least, and hope that nothing too annoying gets in our way. You ready to die? Why does your mic sound so bad? Why do you care? I'm the one who has to listen to it. You should think about getting something better like the mod mic. Ask me about the mod mic. What's the mod? The mod mic is a wireless microphone that can be attached to pretty much any pair of headphones. Personally, I've never been able to find a headset that gets great sound from both its microphone and headphones, so when Antlion Audio reached out to me about the mod mic, I was excited to give it a shot. And it's been awesome. Not only does it sound great, it's what I'm using to record this right now, but it's also super versatile, as it can be attached to any flat surface, whether that be your nice pair of studio headphones, or a VR headset, or even a paper bag. This is part of me now. It connects to your computer through Bluetooth, and setting it up is as easy as plugging in the receiver. As for its other features, it has two modes, one for getting the highest quality sound as possible, and the other for canceling out room noise for those in louder environments. On top of that, it has a 12-hour battery life and a two-year warranty, so in all ways, you're covered for a long time. It's the perfect mic for chatting with friends or streaming, and essentially lets you create your ideal headset by attaching it to whatever you like to use. And if you're more of an in-ear headset kind of person, Antlion has an option for 
for that too with its Kimura line, which also sounds great and has a fair bit of versatility as well, as the microphone can be used with most standard 2-pin or MMCX in-ear monitors. So whatever your needs are, there's a good chance Antlion has something for you. Both of these options give a significant amount of bang for your buck, so if you're looking for an incredible headset microphone without breaking the bank, check them out. Just go to the link in the description and find what works best for you. Can I kill you now? Oh yeah, go for it. Anyway, thanks to Antlion for sponsoring this video. For all of you still here, hi! I'd like to thank my patrons for making this channel possible and give a special shout out to Victor Duva for being an honorary Bag Butin. That's it. Have a great day and our night, and I'll see you in the next one.